some of you know that um, I play hockey, and Friday night passed. Well, we won the final game of the season. Now, I don't expect that there's going to be any big parade for the champion of the PWMHL League. Shout out to Dave, Steve, Kent, and the boys. Now, if the Leafs or the Raptors, well, they live up to all the hype and take home the Stanley Cup or the Larry O'Brien NBA Championship Trophy, well, I'm pretty sure that there will be a parade, some festivity. Downtown T.O. will be pumped. There will be no shortage of dollars that will go into that festivity. The fans will be on the street. The streets probably will be closed downtown when the championship team rolls through downtown T.O. Well, today marks Palm Sunday, and we celebrate the entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. We're certainly continuing our series in the book of Mark, but we do jump ahead a few chapters today to Mark chapter 11. The scripture headings in your version of the Bible could vary from Jesus' triumphant entry or to Jesus comes into Jerusalem as king. But for today, we're just going to title the message, The Big Go, aptly for today. I'm going to read the, the verses from Mark. And it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks why you're doing this, say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? Well, they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity we have of celebrating your son, Jesus. As we share together for some moments, Lord, may we again be renewed with faith, anticipation, expectancy of what you are going to do through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just some background information. Well, this account was recorded in all four of the Gospels, which does signify how important this episode was. The verses we read take place in and around the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital. The temple was there. Jerusalem was the hub and center of Jewish life and worship. Jesus would certainly have been familiar with, this, with the city. He would have been there numerous times already up to this time in his life. Interestingly, writers would say that when Jesus was in Jerusalem, that was when he highlighted and emphasized the aspect of him being the Messiah and the one that the Jewish people had heard prophesied about and were looking for. Uh, we read it. This particular time in Jerusalem would have been around the Passover feast. It certainly would have been a very busy, active time in the city. One author paints the picture this way of, of the recording of John's account of the events. He says, we're led to imagine that there's an enormous crowd of teeming thousands to watch Jesus and give him praise. Estimated more than a million pilgrims would gather in Jerusalem. Thousands and thousands were strict religionists believing in the prophesied Jewish Messiah. Well, the news spreads around the region about the miracles that Jesus had performed. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, Lazarus lived in Bethany. Lots of people would be there to celebrate Jesus. Jasmine read John's account, and if we just look at some other verses in and around what she had read, verse 9 says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus. Verse 17 says, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miracle. Well, then the Pharisees said to each other, see, this is getting us nowhere. 
Look how the whole world has gone out after him. All of this points to the fact that there would have been throngs of people lining the pathway that Jesus took into Bethany, from Bethany into the city of Jerusalem. It seems that it's about three kilometers uh, from Bethany, the descent from the Mount of Olives, and then into the city of Jerusalem. As I was reading that, just thinking about some of the things to share with you today and just feeling some prompting in my spirit, I just thought we'd just look at some physical elements of Palm Sunday. That's the things that we see right in front of us. The base of the Mount of Olives would have been visible from the city and the areas of Jerusalem. And the scene gets set that there would be a large crowd of people gathering with Jesus as he makes his way along this. And then as they see that coming towards them, people in Jerusalem would then have come out of the city and met him and the procession that's following from the Mount of Olives. Jesus, people knew that Jesus was in town and obviously they had gathered toward him. Jesus, in preparation of the journey, we read, he told his disciples, two of them, to go find a colt or a young donkey. Jesus prepared for this trek. You can almost sense the anticipation building with each step along the journey. The disciples go. They find the animal that Jesus said would be there. They receive the animal. They were questioned about, why are you doing this? And they said, the Lord, the master needs it, and we'll bring it back. Didn't seem like there was any question when they heard that. So it was almost acknowledgement that they realized who they're talking about. The Lord, the master needs the animal. And they said, go ahead. The, The animal was released to them. The animal comes back to Jesus. He sits on the donkey. The preparation now turns into a procession. People begin to gather and join in as it moves along. Riding a donkey through the streets. Throngs of people coming out to see him. Spreading their garments. Waving the branches. People shouting. It sounds like such an exciting time. What a parade that must have been. The disciples no doubt were pumped. People who were healed by Jesus, they're saying, that's the man, that's the prophet, that's the person who touched me and I was healed. They probably were joining in. What an amazing journey. That's the one, that's the person that raised Lazarus from the dead. Celebrating the Messiah. The procession becomes a proclamation of Jesus and the coming kingdom of our father David. Well, that's the physical stuff. That's what we're seeing with our visible eyes, a procession, Jesus, people moving along. You've heard the expression before that there's more than meets the eye or there's more to read between the lines. What was really going on here? Lots of things physically, lots of motion, people moving along, celebrating, but what were some other things that were going on? I'll call those the intellectual or the mental elements of Palm Sunday. Take it in. Jesus knew where the young donkey or the colt was. was. And that reminds us again of Jesus' deity. That he was certainly no ordinary person, but he was the son of God. He was deity right there. His knowledge, his power, his authority. He told the the disciples where the animal was exactly, what the response would be. The end result, a donkey was found and again was brought back to Jesus. He used that donkey and then the animal was replaced and returned to the place where it was found. Jesus' deity in the Gospels is on display. There's numerous other verses that record when Jesus knew the thoughts of those that he was interacting with. Luke 5, 22, Mark 2, 8. There's several others. And it just, as Jesus was interacting, he says, I know what's going on in your mind. I know what's happening. Why are you thinking this? Jesus' deity is on display all the time. Matthew 8 records the healing of the centurion's servant. Jesus was not even present with the servant. But scripture records the healing of that servant. Jesus' power and authority was not limited and is not limited by finite space and time. Jesus is able to work anywhere, anytime, everywhere with all power. 
Jesus' deity, his power, his strength, his authority is certainly there on display and available for each one of us. Not only was Jesus' deity on display, but there's some significance here. What about the colt, the young donkey that was used? The donkey, verses says, was not to be ridden before. Symbolizing a pure animal, an unblemished animal that gets used for sacred use. The idea that this was a young donkey, never before ridden, and today that animal gets used to carry Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, used for a sacred purpose, that of carrying the king. A donkey was an animal of noble service, one that was able to work hard to carry, was in noble service. And again, this symbolizes that Jesus comes as a servant Lord. Scripture records that when the disciples picked up the donkey, when they brought him back to Jesus, they threw their garments. They didn't care. They were just going to do whatever they needed to do to make sure that Jesus was able to ride the donkey. A symbol that they were dedicated to him, that they were obediently following after what Jesus wanted. Jesus comes in as a Messiah. Normally, a leader would come into a city riding on a horse saying, here we are. Let's go and take the land. Let's go take the city. Let's, whatever's in our way, let's remove it. Let's get rid of it. But in this case, the donkey was chosen. It was a symbol of coming in peace. That Jesus Christ comes in peace. It is possible that there were people so bent on wanting a Messiah that was confrontational, that was warrior, that was going to come in and defeat the enemy. It's possible they missed the true Messiah that came in peace. Um, I just threw some garments down here. Some palm branches. The whole purpose of people throwing their garments down, waving palm branches, spreading them around, was their recognition that Jesus was their Messiah. The act was kept for royalty, symbolizing one of submission. They believed and said, here we are, we're submitting to you. The act of throwing down their garments and waving palm branches. Palm branches, another symbol of peace, but also a political sign at that point. It points to the fact that the people were still anticipating a political Messiah, one who would release them from their oppressors. One author writes it this way. He says, these are two acts that were always done for kings when they entered a city. The people would take off their cloaks, they would cut down tree branches, and they would spread them out on the roadway before him. In this instance today, they wish to honor and pay him the homage of a king. They wish to show him that they received him as a promised king of kings, the Lord of lords, the promised king of Israel. Jesus came in peace to bring reconciliation, to bring us back to God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. It continues, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far and peace to those who were near. Christ's peace is for each one of us. He came to bring us peace that would bring reconciliation. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Doesn't that make you feel good that Jesus Christ gave his life, came as a ransom for you and I to bring us peace and thereby give us reconciliation with the Father? I believe there's some emotional elements of Palm Sunday. I don't see this put right there in Scripture. But come on, we've all been involved in some celebrations. People were on a high. They just see Jesus as the Messiah. Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming king of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. As you sang this morning, a couple of those songs, there was just a celebration of worship. And I'm sure there were some of you that you're singing and you just hear around and you just join in the praise. 
as the parade, as the procession gathered with Jesus, I'm sure there were people that just went, this is amazing. Probably they thought they were witnessing the coronation of a king. The people had been looking for their Messiah, sort of riding the wave. I'm sure somebody just came in, this is amazing. I want to get involved. What's going on? A sense of ex- expectancy, anticipation with faith. What's going on? Excitement breeds excitement. There's a procession coming down from the Mount of Olives. What's going on? Jesus is coming into the city. I want to be out there. I want to be a part of that. My, my parental liberties in front of you today, have we not, never accused a kid of getting something dirty, a piece of clothing dirty in our household? Well, I can just imagine the teenager that comes home and mom and dad look at his cloak, his coat, and they're going like, what happened to that nice coat that we gave you? And he goes, you know what? I heard Jesus was coming into the city. My friends, we just went out to meet them. And mom, dad, they were just throwing down their cloaks, just honoring Christ as he was coming into the city. And I just took my coat off and I just threw it in there. People walked by. Jesus came by on the donkey. People went by. Well, my jacket looks a little tattered and torn. But... I was there when Jesus came through. I don't see that in Scripture. I don't read it, but there's some good things. There had to be people just saying, I want to celebrate with this procession, with Jesus. Well, there are some things that are in Scripture. The scriptural elements of Palm Sunday. Jesus' deity. I've already said it to you several times already. Again on display. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He was fulfilling the scriptures that were written 500 plus years earlier. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, victorious and righteous, lowly and riding on a donkey. The New Living Translation says, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Prophecy fulfilled. Words written centuries before have now come alive before their eyes. Not everyone would have made the connection, but I'm sure there were some that would have been saying, I remember hearing about this. I remember seeing that. I heard that. There was a a king, a messiah, coming into the city on a donkey. Um, Psalm 118.26 also records these words. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Scripture repeated in this procession, celebration of Jesus coming into the city. Some people would have picked up on that right away. But you know how personalities are. Some of us like attention to detail. Some of us just want to live in the moment. Interestingly, the disciples were not totally aware of everything that was going on. Listen to these words in John chapter 12, verse 16. It says, at first the disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Scripture was fulfilled. Prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus came riding into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey prophecy what happened years before what was written is now coming true in life jesus fulfilled scripture what about the spiritual elements of palm sunday the people shout hosanna which means save please or save us now the people expecting to be released from oppressors, they would have believed that the Messiah would be a victorious Messiah, ready to defeat any person in the way that now they would be released, that they would be in rule. They were hoping for a conqueror, someone to save them from the rule of others. The people were also expressing praise to God for the Messiah who came victorious. Jesus, the Messiah, the true victor, came not to save then but also to save for all time. Christ did not come for a certain group of people, individuals, but Christ came to all who would believe in him. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Messiah, did not just come as a savior to the Jews, but also to the Gentile. That means you 
and I. One writer put it this way. He says, Jesus was coming as a king of peace to save the world spiritually and eternally. And then he continues, Jesus was coming to win hearts and lives spiritually and eternally, not physically and materially. Jesus did not come to conquer a land through battle, through war. He came as a prince of peace, coming to win people's hearts and lives, wanting and desiring to make a difference in each life that encountered him. Luke chapter 19 and 10 reminds us, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Like many of you, hopefully all of you, you've experienced Christ's love in your life, that Jesus died for you and I. He came for you and I, and we've been able to experience his love there. Matthew chapter 121 reminds us right from the beginning with reference to Mary. says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, while at face value seemed to be a coronation, was literally paving the way to his death. While everything on the surface seemed to point towards freedom, behind the scenes, this whole Palm Sunday experience created more animosity between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. And what did that cause them to do? Well, they really didn't join in on the celebration. They just went, who does this guy think he is? And they plotted even harder to destroy Jesus. We know because we have the advantage of reading scripture and knowing that, how quickly things can change. And even for this Palm Sunday journey, the procession that comes in, it sounds like there's obviously a whole lot of activity going on, amazing time, wonderful things going on. And yet we come to verse 11. And verse 11 seems to conclude this segment rather abruptly and maybe a little bit anticlimactic considering all that went on that day. It seemed that the people, the multitudes, had dispersed, and Jesus comes to the temple area. The goal of the day was not just to reach the city of Jerusalem, but Jesus made a point of going to the temple area. Writers about this would say that Jesus was putting himself in danger. The Romans were sensing an uprising. The people were gathering over the weeks, over that time, there just seemed to be a wave coming there for Jesus. They sensed that there was a, an uprising in the air. The ruling party of the day feared that they would be blamed and then they would be replaced. And the Pharisees, I think they were just downright vexed with what was going on to new depths of envy, malice because of Jesus' claims. His deity put on display and they're saying, who do you think you are. The temple was a familiar place for Jesus. He would have been there many times over the years. But today, scripture, it just seems a little different. It was almost like Jesus came into the temple area and was just taking it all in. I think one of the verses says that he, that he took it all in, that he was scoping what was going on, investigating what was taking place, and contemplating the next steps of the day's and things that lay ahead in the coming hours. Verse 11 says, He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. As I read those verses, you get, oh, you're, going, you're caught up, it's amazing, it's wonderful what's going on. And then you come to this place where it just says, He looked around, saw everything, and went, I'm going back to Bethany. The disciples returned with him. I wonder if the decision was to return to the solitude of Bethany where he would be able to spend time praying and preparing for the next day's events that he knew was going to take place at the temple. And the decisions for the next day would create even more animosity and difference and space between Jesus and the rulers. The excitement and celebration of a day comes to a quiet seclusion in the town of Bethany. Friends, this was just the beginning of the Passion Week. You and I have the opportunity to read and experience the sequel of God's love. Jesus will go through an excruciating week for all humanity, 
for Jew, for Gentile, for each one of us, and then culminating in the resurrection. The big go is about sharing and proclaiming Jesus Christ to a world around us. We will take a few moments at the end of this service. Pastor Marie said, we're not supposed to say anything, but pray as you place that plant on that house. A simple plant, the big go is about sharing Jesus Christ to a world around us. That doesn't always happen with the verbal things that go on. It does happen with actions and love. That big go is about sharing Christ to a world around us. If I asked you, who would know the name John Tavares and Kawhi Leonard? Put your hand up. Put your hand down. Who does not know, have a clue who John Tavares is? Who does not know who Kawhi Leonard is? Well, I asked my daughter that question earlier during the week. I said, hey girl, who's John Tavares? She goes, I don't know. Well, I began talking that I do enjoy sports. I'm surprised when people around me do not know the names of two of the biggest superstars in the Toronto sports scene. Both of these individuals were brought in by the Leafs, one organization, Kawhi Leonard for the Raptors, to help them win that big championship. Folks, sometimes what is so important to me I believe others think the same. But what I've come to realize is that others do not even know about the same person, the same ideals, the same situations, the hobbies you like, I go, really? The hobbies I like? We all like different things. The things that I like, you don't even care about. I'm passionate about some things, you're passionate about other things. Let me read one more scripture for you. Matthew 21.10 says this about the Palm Sunday event. It says the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Who is this? Aren't you on social media trending Messiah mania? Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. It's Jesus, the Messiah. Folks, while Jesus was here on earth, people didn't recognize who he was. In a few short days, the accolades of Palm Sunday turns into the impending death on a cross. People still, still did not accept him as the Messiah, as the one who was able to save them. I don't think it's any different today. While we sit here each and every Sunday morning, most people aren't hearing, dare I say, don't even care about Jesus, the Son of God. In their circumstance, maybe even in yours today, you do not realize or trust that Jesus is the one who can save you. In the normal daily routines, chances are, People are not going to ask you, do you know Jesus? Can you tell me a little bit more about Jesus? People still need to know that the Jesus you and I serve, call our Lord, the one that we have experienced in our lives, that he is amazing and worth hearing and telling about. To let them know about Jesus, the one who cares for them in all aspects of their lives. The people around Jerusalem prepared and were excited about Jesus. I trust that we feel the same way today, that as we sing a song of celebration and praise, I'm not saying that you sit down at your office tomorrow morning and you shout praises to this song, but I trust that people are hearing what's going on in your life. Maybe you're not singing at the top of your lungs, but they sense that there's something different about you in the workplace, yourself at school, in your home, that Christ makes a difference in your life. That you and I are able to share the good news that Jesus makes a difference. I'm just going to ask the worship team to come back for just a few moments. And just ask them to play softly a song. 
as we have explored the Palm Sunday journey today, the events of the day, what they meant, how scripture was fulfilled, some of the spiritual implications, how does it make a difference for you and us, you and I today? How does it impact us? How does that apply? How can we take this word today, this scripture passage, and apply it to us? Well, one, who is Jesus to you? Do you believe that Jesus is the king to be praised? Do you believe Jesus is the savior, your savior? Have you acknowledged him as king of your life and embraced Jesus as the one who has saved you? People in the city of Jerusalem missed out on the Messiah because maybe he didn't look exactly like the person they were expecting him to be, like the one who could save them. There were certainly some pride issues with the religious leaders. Maybe others wanted Jesus to take care of all their problems. Then they would give allegiance to the king. Maybe we want God to fix all of our challenges. Then I will submit to Christ. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, well, the Christian life looks too rigid. Or on the opposite, oh, it's too soft. I don't need anything or anyone to help me along this journey. Maybe you think it's too boring. Well, there's a few people here that would say, you know what, I'm a pretty normal guy. I think serving God's pretty fun. I get to enjoy some of the things that others get to enjoy. I enjoy playing hockey. I enjoy doing that. I enjoy that life journey. Can I challenge you that do not let excuses or the past or maybe even the future keep you from receiving Christ. Secondly, are you willing to go and prepare the way for others to hear about and share the love of Jesus to those who come across your pathway? To prepare the way for others to encounter Jesus Christ and receive him. I hope we don't expect Christ to just show up in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our campuses and do it all. I believe he can and he could. But I believe his challenge was for us as a church, his body, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. And thirdly, what are you and I willing to do that will let those around us know that Jesus is coming, that Christ wants to be their Savior? I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. We've talked about a journey, a physical journey, but more importantly today, we're talking about a spiritual journey. Jesus Christ came so that all would come to know him in peace to be reconciled to him. I don't know all that you're going through, where you're at when it comes to your relationship with God. Is Jesus king of your life? I don't know that. But I do want to ask for you that are here, maybe you're saying, I would like Christ in my life. I might be tired, confused, even frustrated with the way things are going, and I want to experience God's peace in my life. If that's you today, I'm just going to ask you to simply put up your hand and say, yes, I would like to accept Jesus Christ in my life.